Welcome to the Circle of Birth podcast. I'm your host and advocate, Ali Kranz. These podcasts are here to gather stories, people and information to better our understanding of the wisdom of birth and how we can reclaim our connections to birth from conception and beyond. You will hear stories not only from Australia but from all over the world, bringing together women, partners, midwives, doulas and all the people that have a birth story to share. So jump right in for this next Circle of Birth story. So this show today is welcoming Zoe Naylor and Zoe brings to the show her super aware self and lots of mama wisdom that she also shares on her inspiring blog, Kafta and Mama. Um, Zoe is a mother of two. She's an actor, a journalist, a writer and an activist and a producer and you know you're in good company of someone that shares her experiences straight from her centre, the core of her heart. (laughs) We look into her two birth experiences with Sophia and Bo. One is a hospital centre and Bo is the home birth and both very quick labours. Her recent birth has sparked her to head into production of a documentary called Birth Time. This will be one of a kind in Australia, so stay tuned as they are looking to release this sometime in 2017. So remember to check out the link too and the show notes and check out the resources that Zoe has shared. There's some pretty cool, insightful stuff in there and some she's shared with us too some of her beautiful home birth images. Uh, Circleofbirth.com or you can just click the link um, from here. So enjoy. Hi Zoe, thank you so much for joining us. Um, I appreciate your time to come on the show and welcome and you're going to share with us today uh, two birth stories. I am, thank you so much for having me Ali, I'm thrilled to be here today. Mm, Me too. So do you want to start off um, and talk a little bit about yourself and then we can kick into your birth with Sophia. Oh okay, yeah well um you know, up until recently, I've I've predominantly worked as an actress in this country, and um, and then about eight or so years ago, I um, sorry, that's my little one in the background, <laughs> multitasking mum. About eight years ago, I, I embarked deeply on a journey of what I call awakening, um, with a history of addiction, and through the course of that, um, I believe healing is holistic. It's mental, emotional, spiritual, and physical, and of course, the role of the mother. Um, has been expanded in ways that I never even knew. Um, And so, yeah, my journey not only in healing has been for myself but also my experience of motherhood and birthing. And now it's an integral part of my Kaftan Mama platform where I guide, support and inspire others on their journey of awakening wherever that may be. And, uh, yes, Sophia was born, she's four now, and she was obviously born four years ago and I was, you know, I was in the early stages of my healing journey and I had started off thinking that I would have her with an obstetrician in a private hospital, thinking that that was going to be where I was going to receive the best care, you know, the most exclusive place equals the best care and and um, that was fine. I, was, I, I guess I was ignorant about birth like most women, it's not really a conversation you have openly. It's kind of like what I've learned about your moon time. You you know, you just kind of get on with it. And I was blind. And it, the universe is a funny way of putting people and things in your path when to help support you. And, and on the path of birth, a doula was put into my sphere. And I thought, oh, yeah, a birth partner. Wow, okay. Because for me, my sisters and my mother – Although I'd love them now to be in my in, in, in my birth plan, they, they weren't. And they're not really, I guess, the people that were able to hold space for me. So a doula was going to be that person. And, and then when I went to have an appointment at the private prestigious hospital, then I, um, then I, uh, they said to me that I couldn't bring the doula with me to my birth. And I was kind of jarred in that moment. And so then the universe put other people in my path that suggested what about uh, a public system or how about a midwife group program in a birthing unit and I didn't even know they were options and so I looked into that and I found the manly birthing unit and and I was lucky enough to get a, a place in that midwife group program I was halfway through my pregnancy and I had the one-on-one midwifery care which was amazing 
And how, how did that feel? Um, just sort of, you had a few appointments, I guess, with your obstetrician, and then just engaging <laughs> with that midwife. Um, did it feel like you could breathe? I suppose a sense of like coming home and you could relax into your pregnancy. Uh, yeah, you know, like you don't know what you don't know <laughs> until yeah, you know. Yes. And I think that um, once I had women communicating with me on a level which was not about procedures and surgical terms and, you know, I, I kind of shifted the feeling of what pregnancy was. So, you know, I went from having all this terminology about procedures and, um, and what might happen and to kind of embodying and starting to talk a language where I was, you know, looking to trust that my body would know what to do and an energy of women that weren't designed, you know, obstetricians are trained surgeons and naturally they're an amazing group of people but they're designed to cut you open, you know. Emergency so, situation. Yeah, which which was kind of really, I was kind of floored, I remember, at the time. And and then Sophia was considered a, a low-risk um, pregnancy and I ended up labouring at home. And although, you know, but I still really didn't know what was happening to my body in hindsight. And I, I then got to the uh, birthing unit and she was born 20 minutes later back in the pool and so although I had a seamless, somewhat seamless uh, labour, I did emerge, you know, it was a five-hour labour, which is a gift by most standards for your first child. But I emerged somewhat traumatised because I had no, you know, what I'd just done was life-altering, amazing, but really wasn't I wasn't set up for it in any of my understanding or wisdom around birth and what it was, you know, the three great rites of passage for women in this life is your menarche. Is it when you get your moon time in your yeah. teens, yep, yep. Your, your birth, birthing, birth, yep. and then when you're initiated to become a wise woman when you have menopause. And so those rites of totally not a part of the North Shore private school upbringing that I had. And so um, although I, I emerged from that birth, you know, I kind of went into my first baby really, yeah, kind of in the dark. And although I breastfed and I fed her for three years and we modelled ourselves as attachment parents and we co-sleep and luckily I, I found my way from the council-suggested uh, uh, mother's group which met at the cafe having a latte to uh, an attachment mother's group meeting in a park with kids of all ages to women who were just like flooring me with their presence and grace and beauty like I just was like wow all my ambition and striving which I was head girl of my school and scholarships to uni I was going to be a prime minister not a mother you know like I thought I'd be a mother always but I thought it would kind of I don't know I guess I, I hadn't really thought about it. I didn't have any idea what it was to embody the role of a mother you know yeah. and now and so I had to do this huge about face with Sophia where I was going to Hollywood hammer and tongs and and I kind of just kept surrendering to this beautiful child who was asking me to be present without my ambition. And God, it was difficult. Mm. And so luckily, as I continued journeying towards my discomfort with the support of long-term therapy and, and the healing world in all its capacity, nutrition and everything and emotional health, I've come off that anxiety or those drivers, you know, and, and the home and the attachment mother's we're talking about home birthing and I was like I didn't even know you could do that <laughs> I didn't even know it existed you know like I did have a judgment that home birthing was unsafe and it was for the kumbaya mothers around the campfire and you know it wasn't for me I didn't even know but the more I spent time with these women I wanted I wanted what they had you know they had a peace in them a serenity that was just like oh you know it makes me cry when I think about it just like a wow just, I know the feeling. You it's, know, just it's, like a relaxed, yeah. like, wow, that's yeah. just. It's like sisterhood, isn't it? It's that feeling. Yeah, it's like we're, we're in it together. Here we are and it's I so just, warming. I strive <laughs> for this other thing, this career and motherhood. And so, you know, I started to let go of, of those drivers and, and my partner, who's also an actor, he, he just kept shifting me there as well. And I, 
Thank goodness. And uh, so then when it came for us, you know, having this space, capacity and energy to want to create another being in this world, then I I really, home birth was just like on my radar. And so I really looked into that and 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 uh, found Jo Hunter and and met her and I just – she just felt like the mother I never had. And <laughs> did you meet with any other home birth yes, midwives? We did, and everyone we met was lovely. And I guess that my my suggestion there is really just to go where your heart says, you know. And everyone, we're all different people. Our makeups are different, and we're going to resonate with different personalities. But Joe, for me, was just like it was just it. And the kids actually decided; they they chose her. <laughs> I have a bonus daughter who's 13 and Sophia obviously is four and so we um she was three at the time and they all went, Yeah, Joe. Oh, cool. <laughs> and then and then my fear did set in once I chose I was choosing a home birth and I had all my family and I had, you know, close all I heard was the fear stories. Why are you doing that? It's unsafe. All you know, so it took me the beautiful thing about one on one midwifery care is you share your most intimate fears with your midwife. That allows you to build a really solid foundation of trust. And so I would share what I was coming up for me. Are we going to be all right? What if something happens, you know? And she just heard me. And then we put into place, you know, all those plans for anyone considering it. Like if anything was to happen, you do transfer to a hospital, you know? Like it's just the options were totally there. It was no different from me labouring at home in the northern beaches and transferring to Manly. It was 45 minutes away, you know, like. Anyway, yeah, so it's, 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 it's exactly right, you know, and it's good to look at it in that perspective. Um, I think, especially for two, for people that are considering home birth, um, instead of having that, oh, uh, you know, it's not a safe place. It's that sort it's of the opposite, actually. Yeah, Can I tell you, like, it's the opposite because yeah. what's unsafe is, it, it, you know, and I've just had it, one of my best friends' birth in the in Darwin. The home birth group there were tied to the hospital. So as soon as there's anything that presents that's not, you know, by the book, you're back in the hospital system where intervention is common practice. Now, I can't comment the statistics there, but I'm sure you, Ali, will, will interview women who will share those. But mm-hmm. what happens to women as a result of inter- intervention in the hospital system? And, what you know, for me, like what happened after this beautiful relationship where Joe would come every month for the, you know, after three months and then in the last six weeks, every week, we, we developed this bond where I could just hand over to her, you know, and, and the labour, like the labour was three and a half hours with Bo. We had a birth pool. My partner, Aaron, he was so engaged this time. You know, they say the men start with more fear than the woman but end up more and more even more of an advocate than the mother. Yeah, yeah, I've heard you know, that, yeah. And, and in the you know, he was afraid at first and you know, but but in the labor, on the night that I birthed at RPA, there was twenty nine women who birthed with five midwives on duty. That means a midwife would probably check in with their woman in labor every eight or nine contractions. Now, there was not one contraction that Aaron or Joe didn't miss by putting their hands on my lower sacrum using the natural pressure points for pain. They met every contraction with their presence, their love and their energy. Now, that meant that I felt totally supported and totally held. And when I was faced at that moment of transition when you go, I don't know if I can do it, they were like, yes, and I believed them. So that allowed me to surrender and open and allow my body to do what it inherently knows. And I birthed Bo, he was 55 centimetres, 10 pounds and posterior, naturally with no tear. Wow. You know, know, like, and I did it. And at at the end of my labour, you know, we're about to embark on on creating a, a documentary, you know, and Jo says to me, my midwife, she says, what if women were to emerge from their births emotionally safe and physically well and I really got it this time you know I I'm I was asked I'm back in the world with my work and taking Bo but very quickly after the birth of Bo I, I I take him with me everywhere he's so relaxed and such an amazing sleeper and the breastfeeding is effortless and I I'm I'm sure it's to do, to do with my body's recovery, my mental health. Like I definitely had a bit of post-traumatic, uh, not post-traumatic stress or postnatal depression, although you probably call it post-traumatic stress. Yeah. 
Um, Sophia, for sure, was with him. I've had nothing. Like I'm loving motherhood, whereas before it was a struggle. You know, that may also have something to do with it being my second, but I feel like I could do it again tomorrow. Yeah. You know, yeah. whereas Sophia, it took years before I felt like I was ready to do it again. And I and I feel like this is a this is the embodiment of home birth. I haven't left my space. She came to me. You know, I didn't have to pack a bag. There was none of that, oh, my God, when's it going to happen feeling, trying to organise life around the procedure of labour, you know. Like I, I just felt – and the other thing that is I learned in this process is the ritual of a blessing way, you know. Before with Sophia I had the Western baby shower where everyone bought a gift and, God, it was soulless. Lovely but kind of soulless compared to a blessing way where I had 30 women – and it's hard for me to allow women in my life with my history of addiction, which is quite a solo thing, you know, and I was very ambitious and driven and and kind of like I suppose the embodiment of capitalistic society. But <laughs> I, I, I've struggled to allow women it close to me, you know. That also is a comment about my relationship with the mother, you know. Yeah. Um, but but on a blessing way, you invite 30 women and no one brings a gift. You bring a bead and we threaded a necklace for me with an intention for me in my labour with Bo. And, and and when I went into, I'm sorry, I'm getting teary, but when I went into labour, I put that necklace on and someone, someone messaged all the women and let them know. And I had the energy of all those women with me. So worth doesn't become this solo thing you're doing in a hospital cold environment. It becomes this kind of ritual, this this rite of passage, this amazing thing. And when you when you do it naturally, God, you you don't know yourself like you know yourself after birthing naturally. And you just don't. You know, you really it changes my capacity as a mother, as a woman holding space with my man. It changes my my work in the world. I'm not driven to waste time and energy on things that don't matter. You know, I'm more of service. I just, everything is affected and infected by my having natural birth. And I'm not saying that, you know, of course there's going to be situations where it doesn't unfold that way for whatever the reason. And then of course, have your backup option as the hospital, but don't, I guess I, I, I really would love more women not to have to go there as their first port of call. Like bring it back to themselves in their home where they feel safe with the one-on-one midwifery care, you know, and then if then look at the alternative. And, and we, um, with this documentary I'm really intrigued. Like, what would that mean for society as a whole? What would that mean if women loved motherhood more than they do, if we weren't striving to be a mother and have this other career? What would it mean, you know, what would it mean? What would it mean for children suffering with addiction, you know, when the emotional presence wasn't there from motherhood? You know, my therapist, he says that we've had two and a half thousand years of unconscious parenting, not because people would were wanting to do it badly, but just because we've not known how to do it. You know, there's been no role modelling. Yeah, as, yeah, as women yeah. in the in the who who in the world are we looking up to to saying that yes, motherhood, yes, this is it. In fact, I've got a great quote on my on my vision board that says all other careers exist to support the mother. Yeah. But as women, we don't we're not content with it. We're not content. It's um I was talking to someone yesterday about this too and thinking in feminine and masculine and oh, yeah, you know that started here. <laughs> yeah, and she she's got a beautiful tale of becoming a midwife and she gave that up last year because of the similar thing it's it wasn't serving women um it was serving a system and serving the state and like you said the the soul and the feminine decisions weren't there they were masculine orientated and Maybe she should go into private practice. That's what we need. We need more women midwives in private practice, like New Zealand, you know? Yeah, and it's just, it's unfortunate, isn't it? Because, you know, with the new legislation coming up, they're getting driven apart from that. So, right. uh, but that's another thing. We need, we need, one of my work as an activist is this let's get this documentary to the policy yeah. makers. If we could allow, like in New Zealand, the midwives are trained to go more into private practice than into the system. Again, make the system an option, but more like the the, the, the third one on, on the rank, not the first, you know, like 
let's empower the midwives to be in private practice so that the women have choice. You know, imagine if women can choose of equal measure where they want to birth, whether that's in a hospital, in a birthing unit or at home. Yeah. Make home birth an equally viable option for women. Yeah. You know what? Um, I mean, imagine your first appointment instead of being like, put your arm out, get on the scales and fill this form out and going, wow, well done. Where would you like to have your baby? Let's make this happen. You can go to the hospital and have a look. You can meet a home birth midwife or you can go to an obstetrician. What would you like to do? It's giving women their rights and their choices back. One of my work under Kaftan Mama is really to – empower women back in their role you know and we talked before about the feminist movement like the the role of the I love the movie Noah you know so Jennifer Connelly's role is of Noah's wife in the film and she embodies this sovereign power this gentle power it's not it's it's equal to the man but it's different in its nature and I feel like you know, and maybe I'm wrong, but it feels to me like feminism has been about meeting men in men's terms, rah, yang, you know, mm-hmm. equal pay, all of this. And, yes, equal pay, but but from a place where you're leading from a different way, you know, from the feminine way, from the goddess way. Mm-hmm. Like yeah. I know with Aaron, if I'm, if I'm in my ambitious self or if I'm, let's use the driven self, when I'm too busy, he doesn't want to go to bed with that, you know. It's not It's not the embodying of a feminine beauty. It's like masculine and a bit hard. Mm. And so I always have to come back to the mother. The women that I've met who are embodying that role, they're soft and gentle. They're powerful because the most sensitive women that I've met have home birthed or free birthed, for God's sake. That's a powerful thing to do. But they hold a space that's kind of warm and kind and open and allowing and listening and (coughs) you know and Mm. that's the polar opposite to the person I was when I when I started looking at at healing like wow yeah yeah. (laughs) and that's where I want to be more and more Mm. you know I really want to be more and more there Mm. than uh, it seems like the children have come (coughs) along into the journey and you know it's just more transformation that's happened to you and it's such a beautiful thing when you can honour your space and acknowledge um, that real innate woman wisdom. <laughs> I just think oh, it, I it's so powerful. Do you want to just sort of go back to Bo's birth and um, just briefly talk about the um, labour? there? Because you said it was three hours, is that right? Bo's birth, three and a half, yeah. Wow. But, <laughs> you know, I had a lot of... Um, you know, it's interesting. I was subconscious, obviously, but from Sophia, although Sophia's labour was 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 fast and uh, uncomplicated, <clears throat> I did have a little bit of trauma from just that going through that with no understanding of what I was about to do. <laughs> yeah. So when at three in the morning on the morning of uh, uh, on the day of Bo's birth, I did have a contraction, but I thought it was a dream, <clears throat> and then that morning. I was a bit irritable with Aaron. I remember snapping at him a, a few times and he was like, oh. And then I, I remember call. I didn't want to call my midwife for some reason and um, because I think I didn't want it to be labour, you know, when I was faced with that moment because, you know, once the train start, leaves the platform, you can't go back. Yeah. <laughs> and then every time I walked around, I was like, oh. So what I've learned for me around labour is, is that I will know when it's starting and when I lay down, I lay down then, I lay down for the next two hours and I didn't get up and then it kind of slowed down. So my midwife was an hour away but I feel like there was plenty of time for her to get there for me. And um, like I said when we birthed Sophia, I was still 45 minutes from Manly from where I was living at the time. So <clears throat> it was kind of no different. Mm. And did you um, did you have lots of like sort of leading up like a few days before? Did you have lots no, of like nothing. Braxton Hicks or anything like that? No, no, nothing, yeah. nothing. Wow. That was my fear. Like, will I know? I thought he was. I was ready for two weeks before he came. I yeah. was like, day is this it? But no, it was like my mind kind of creating that a bit. As soon as I got up and walked around, labor really 
And so Joe then said, you've got to get up and walk around and see if this is it. And I did. And then they were six minutes apart. So by the time it was at that point, that was three and a half hours from that point. So, yeah. Wow. And you managed to get in the water in time and... Oh, there's pl- there was plenty of time. You know, like I lay on the couch for an hour until she got here. The biggest thing that I wanted was to film the birth. And my the lady filming it was coming from Bondi to Bilpin, which is where we birthed Bo. And um, <clears throat> that's a two-hour drive in, pra- in traffic. <laughs> oh. So actually the bir- getting in the bath was like natural morphine. God, it was good, yeah. <laughs> that birth pool. <clears throat> and then I put the necklace on and then I was really worried that he, that he was going to come before she got here. But she made it. And I think maybe he turned <clears> – <throat> And became posterior, uh, I was wondering, to allow more time for her to film it because we're going to open the um, Home Birth Australia conference with our birth film next year, which I'm seeing and I'm really excited because I really, my intention was to, to really use this film to help empower women to choose natural birthing, you know. Yeah, I'll definitely put the links in the show notes to the Home Birth Conference, which is I think is November 2017. That's right. That's yeah. right. So, yeah, yeah and, I'm, and, and and to be honest, I've I've been married before and I I, mean, I haven't never I never even watched that that um film of the marriage at the time, but the birth film I've watched like eight times and yeah. gosh, it's amazing. <laughs> That's amazing. If everyone everyone could have the opportunity to film their birth do it. Like yeah. we use this beautiful woman who's going to actually be the DOP for the documentary. Her name's Jerusha Sutton um, and she's incredible. And so, yeah, if you get the opportunity to work with her, get her to film your birth. She's also a doula. She's just a beautiful, beautiful. Yeah, great. And <coughs> she's Sydney-based obviously. Yeah, she's, yeah, she's actually about to have a baby at home for her wow. birth. She's very brave. <laughs> Um, another good point too when you're talking about sort of, you know, one midwife to um, 29 people. Um, this oh, is no, that's, a, <clears throat> yeah, five, sorry, five. Sorry, five, five midwives to 29 yeah. people. Good, yeah. This is where it's great to have a doula in a hospital situation um, because they're your constant. So if anyone's, you know, wanting to go the natural birth route with a hospital, right. um, hiring a doula is just <coughs> such an invaluable thing, I feel. I know, but then that hospital that I was going to have Sophia at said I couldn't bring them. So, yeah. and that's quite common in private hospitals, isn't it? With I don't know, I was a doula. floored by that. You know, yeah. I'm sure they have their reasons, but at that moment in in my um, pregnancy, it just felt didn't feel right. Mm. <laughs> Didn't feel supported for me choosing the birth that I wanted, yeah. <laughs> so with, with Bo's birth, did you get that feeling, <clears throat> even though it was fast, uh, there is a lot of women that say fast labours, they feel a bit like oh, they wish it was longer, I suppose, to experience it more. Did you <clears throat> feel <clears throat> you really tapped into that relaxed space and um, I, I suppose do you feel happy that it was that long or do you wish it was longer? Oh, no, gosh, I wouldn't want it any faster. No, why would I want it longer? (laughs) Like I don't think birth's about relaxing. I think it's about surrendering. Yeah, yeah. And it's really about um, trusting and, um, yeah. Mm. I remember when it came to, you know, pushing – it took a lot longer to get Bo uh, down the canal than Sophia. Sophia felt like, and maybe it's because I was more present with Bo in his labour than Sophia. Perhaps she just was two pushes and she was out. Yeah, well, well, I suppose he was like a four. It was fifty minutes from the time I was pushing. Like wow, and that's because he was bigger and posterior. But yeah. like I said, like I mean even to the point where he was crowning, like I think I no one really guided me with that in the hospital, so I tore. Whereas with Bo, Joe reminded me of the ha-ha-ha, you know, because she was right there with me present. Mm. So that wasn't missed. Yeah. You know, I wonder what, what's missed in the hospitals when you, of course, the, the, the midwives are under the pump and they've got women coming in across shifts and changing over and, I'm sure when it's busy, things are missed. It's natural. We're human. Yeah, 
Yeah, that's right, yeah. I mean, and they've got a big job to follow, <coughs> you know, what they have to – procedures and um, that type of thing and I suppose it's – Oh, yeah, totally. That, that, that's right. Yeah. And I think it's really important we're not creating an us and them scenario. It's it's all. It's yeah. all, all working together. Yeah. You, Obstetricians you. open to home birth midwives. Home birth midwives – working with a hospital midwives, it, it, it's not, it, or midwives are midwives. It's just to have this appreciation for birth in its natural way. Like apparently obstetricians in their training, and maybe you need to clarify this, don't go to natural births. It should be compulsory. Mm. What is it like when you don't actually interfere? Yeah, You know, yeah. maybe the respect for the woman's body would change. In fact, in um, <clears throat> Indigenous, uh, there was a great story that I heard. There was quite a lot of cases of domestic violence and alcoholism rife in Indigenous community because they were, were removing the women to, to go to hospitals to birth. Yeah. And then they changed um, the policy where they, they let the women stay in the communities and they, and they brought the midwives to them. And after they were birthing in their communities, domestic violence went down, alcoholism, alcoholism was halved. Because Aaron said this, his appreciation and love of me, it like he said it was tripled because he really, really experienced labour with me. He felt my body open when he had his hands on my sacrum. So his respect for me um, was heightened even more, mm. you know. And, and so when the man has that, what does that mean for his psyche? You know, I wonder whether, this is funny, we're watching the Bledisloe Cup and Australia's getting smashed, you know. The men in New Zealand, there's a different sensibility. One, because they're not denying their Indigenous foundation with, um, with the Maori. They're integrated, whereas we have ostracised the Indigenous and are trying somehow to put them back together. But as men, they're part of birth there, you know. Mm. Allows the man to be the man, the woman to be the woman, back to that sovereign power and the role of masculine and feminine, really embodied masculine and feminine, not demasculating, masculine, what's that word? Sorry, demasculating, whatever that. Yeah. yeah <laughs> and <laughs> take their role. But yeah. giving, going back to why we have men and women in the society, you know? Yeah. I think all the people listening would understand that because I understand and I feel it's like it's the same as just after you've birthed it's something like working with the natural systems is doing its thing and it's 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 kind of it's a similar thing if you allow that space for masculine and feminine to do their thing in a biological sense it's it's gonna you know it's gonna flow um, totally. We, we, we are so indoctrinated in this society where we have to try and fix all these things all the time because it just simply wouldn't work that way or <laughs> it's just... Oh, yeah, the control, control, control. I know, yeah. yeah. Um, but going back to what you said about the home versus hospital, um, I did a podcast <clears throat> two episodes ago and she said it beautifully. She said it's all about choices and sometimes we get caught up in the home versus hospital thing when it's really about the continuity and support and doing these podcasts, is, this is all I hear is we need continuity of care and we need support for these mothers yes. to do what is natural in their system, in their body. That's and, right. Yeah. Yeah. And it, it, like you said, it's sisterhood and we need to come together on that and not not isolate ourselves and each other. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. So just to wrap it up, you've got a bit of resources. Would you like to share sort of with even with both pregnancies and birth? Um, there's two things that come up. I will share that. But, you know, the first thing I'd love to say to women is you know, in your heart you know. And so sometimes when we're afraid, we grapple for things outside of ourselves, which can sometimes overcomplicate and confuse what you know inherently. So actually to sit in meditation is key when you're uh, maybe look, searching for an answer for something. So early on with Sophia, I actually ditched all the books, you know, and just uh, really watch, wait and wonder with your own child and tune in because mother and child have that beautiful relationship where they're not separate from you until they're 18 months. They don't know it. So you will know. 
more than you have to kind of search for information. That's really actually a good point to make, Zoe, and beautifully said because it's – I know a lot of people are facing decisions and, you know, say a twin birth, you're instantly high risk and then you have this whole barrage of decisions that you have to face – which is really hard because you're tossing between am I doing the right thing for my baby or am I going to be a bad mother if I ditch all this information and try and find that spot within to tune into your baby and what's happening. And um, that's really a good point because innately we know. <laughs> yeah, and sometimes too much information can make you more confused. Yeah. But Analysis now I'm going to jump. <laughs> yeah, but, but, but equally I have so guidance from women I I really trust and they're not always been in my immediate family um I have got a beautiful woman called Maya Tawari she wrote a book called Women's Power to Heal through Inner Medicine that's amazing resource for women who are wanting to get their cycles um aligned with the moon so that they could be most fertile um she's got a beautiful school called the wise earth school i'm about to start study there in ayurvedic nutrition um my homeopath uh bernadette english who's a legend she actually gave me a resource called a guide to child health it's by makeda glocker and wolfgang goebel <laughs> i think they're german But it's all about holding space for your little ones when they're not well. So often, again, the fear, the knee-jerk reaction, quickly take to the doctor, quickly, like pregnancy, go to the hospital, you know, how to, uh, what what each illness or each thing that might arise represents and what it really means for their greater immune building. So it's a brilliant resource for young, if you've got young kids. Right. Um, a book called Why Love Matters by Sue Gerhardt. It was one my uh, uh, our therapist put us onto, and it's called How Affection Shapes a Baby's Brain. It's basically smashes through all the formation of addiction and, and anorexia and all disorders really come as a result of a, of a mother's uh, inability to be emotionally present and available with the children, which is really the symptom of the two and a half thousand years of, of unconscious parenting. Uh, so does that so, sort of go into like intergenerational stuff where we're like handing down inheritance yes, behaviours? All of, and, and, absolutely. Yeah. So cool. when people okay. say, oh, he's just, you know, you hear it about rugby players, oh, he's just an addict or he's just, like it's such a label that was such ignorance. You know, we've really got to go back to, to, to and then again, empowering women to be mothers from birth, you know. If they love that, then they'll want to be, they'll want to look more into motherhood. They won't want to be palming off the kids as quickly to go back to, to work. And equally, the government might stop throwing money at women to go back to work and maybe throw money at creating support networks for women to enjoy being at home longer and maybe financially supporting them so we don't have to work, go back to work so quickly in order to pay the mortgage, for God's sake. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And then um, the Ricky Lake documentary, The Business of Being Born, I found fascinating. Yeah. That was a that's a good awakening one for a lot of people actually. Yeah, if you don't if you feel overwhelmed by reading. Yeah. And I haven't um I haven't watched the other other Australian one, but it's the face of birth, but apparently that's it's on my to do list. And hopefully, look, you know, our working title of our doco is called Birth Time. Um and that, that's a keep you posted one. So hopefully that will provide some um great information for people. Cool. Have you got a um, sort of pending release date of that oh no we just got our first interview tomorrow (laughs) (laughs) no we're that we're gonna crowdfund though so well how long do these documentary you you're a professional in the industry how long do they take to make (laughs) um friends of ours did that sugar film and that you know he i i sought his advice the other day and he just said look just keep walking in your heart and trust the unfolding so I feel like uh, we'll be guided with 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 everything we're going to need. Hopefully, within a year, I'm hoping. Oh, great! Because time the time is now. It's really a time for us to take back our our power as women when it comes to birthing and really making the choices that feel right for us and connecting with what's right for us and having our one on one midwifery care so that we can create the generation of kids who are going to be you know, healing this planet and, and, and having a life which is abundant and passionate and full of love, not fear, you know, that's the, that's the core of, of birth. That's the core. 
Mm. Birth for humanity. <laughs> it is. It is. Birth, yeah. And I'm all goosebumpy yeah. now. And yeah. now I'm looking at your thing, the circle of birth. It's oh. that. Yeah, yeah. It is that. Yeah. Yeah. And it's a beautiful book, this is a tangent, called by, by the woman who wrote Eat, Pray, Love, um, called Big Magic. It talks about creativity and birth is the ultimate form of creativity. But equally, this beautiful podcast series that you're birthing is your, it's a creative download. It's come through universal intelligence for you to do as a gateway for others to shift. And it's, 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 it's going to be because it has to be, there's no other way. It's, yeah. it's the ultimate alignment of being of service yes. with abundance. It's great. Uh, yes. <laughs> we serve the mother. <laughs> And Mother Earth. That's yes. right. <laughs> well, thank you, Zoe. So much appreciated for you um, coming to share such honourable words of wisdom. What a journey that you've had and a transformation. And I'm sure so many people, women, men, all as midwives going to take a little piece of your words of wisdom and your journey and put that into theirs and we can all grow together. So much appreciated. Yeah, thank you. And I can't wait to listen to all of the others in this beautiful series. Thank you. Did you connect with this episode? Then head over to our website, circleofbirth.com. There you'll find show notes, pictures, resources, and potentially connect with today's storyteller. Don't forget to sign up to be updated with new empowering episodes and content. Help the show grow by contributing a tip in the jar to make sure we can continue to better the podcast and connect more and more to the wisdom of birth and each other. Hey, and don't forget the iTunes rating. This has been another episode of the Birth Share Project. We breathe, we birth, we empower. Thank you.